Hallelujah. Jenny, I just love all the scriptures that you, um, you read. <laughs> you can just see the passion inside of you. I just love it. I love it. I love it. Praise the Lord for people that, that are uh, sold out to the Lord. And uh, there's, many, there's many people that are sold out to the Lord. It's a wonderful thing. There's a few announcements uh, this week. Everything is going as it, as it is in the week. We have the lunch bunch, the women's Bible study, and Thursday nights all, all going as it normally goes. And uh, Sam phoned me from Connect. She's, she and Jocelyn are working at Connect. And the supervisor that uh, was in charge when she was there asked if this church will be willing to donate warm jackets, maybe warm clothes for the winter. When we were there on, was it, was it Wednesday? We, we went, no, we didn't go Wednesday morning, Thursday morning. But Thursday morning was wet. When was it so wet? And the people were sitting, it was Thursday morning, it was so wet and their feet, you could, you could see it's, it's not fun sitting out there. They tried to cover themselves under tarps. And so yeah, s- uh, people are in a, in a um, predicament. They are captured to a lot of stuff. It's, it's very easy to say, but just get off the street or just do this or do that. But I've discovered that people are so broken in their minds that they can't even think a minute from now what to do the right thing. It, it, it's weird that people can be so broken. So many times they need a lot of time to change. And that's why a lot of the Christian organizations have a year. They give a, p- a guy a year to change his mind. Just get him off the street, give him food, give him a place to sleep, pump him full of the Bible, you know, because that changes, pump him full of Jesus, get him to you know, understand his identity in Christ, and then they change. So the people on the street, they're in serious trouble. They need, they need help. They've been captive to sin. Satan has bound them. So if we can help them in time of need, you know, um, please feel free. I would, I would think bring it to the office if you can, and from here we'll take it to Connect. Um, I hope we need a big, I hope we'll have to ask Ernie with his big uh, van to put all the jackets and stuff in his van <laughs> to take it down there. <laughs> Wonderful. And then we have birthdays coming up in October. This week is going to be Jim. Hallelujah. So thankful that the Lord has saved him all of this, all of this time. 83, can you believe it? Wonderful. Wonderful. We're so glad with you, Jim and Dolores, uh, for the time the Lord has given you. Then at the bottom of this um, uh, letter, there is Operation Christmas Child. Please look at that, and if you can maybe help with that. I saw the impact of this in South Africa. We were, we were at a, our, our children went to a very poor school because that was the closest to us. Th- they were rich children and very poor children because there was, there was a squatter camp very close by to the, ch- the school they went to. And a lot of those children, extremely poor. And one day a truck pulled up, and they opened the container, and this Operation Christmas Child, every child got a box And what excitement. You should have seen their children when they got that box. You know, so um, if you can get involved, get involved. Only the Lord will tell one day, you know, where your box or your input, where it went and how many people people were blessed by your input. So, yeah, get involved. Be generous. (laughs) Get involved. Yes, madam. Yes, yes, yes. Well, the school that was a was a, a primary school, so the kids were like 12 max, 12, 13 max, very young, grade two, grade one children. Just so excited about it, but I understand what you say. And I'm not sure, are you allowed to put...
wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, so there's many ways of, of um, getting involved. Amen. I asked a dear brother this morning to read for us a passage that I've uh, found at the beginning of the week, and it had s- such an impact into my, you know, my spirit that day. So I asked a dear brother, uh, Frank, to come and read it for us, and just uh, after that, uh, pray for us. Please, Frank, you are welcome. from Philippians 2. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, consider others. You should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but make himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Dear Lord, let us not do anything out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Help us to be like Jesus with a servant's heart, especially pride. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for today. We lift up Gordon this morning. like to pray for him. Um, joy of the Lord. Amen. The Lord became obedient to death, even death on a cross. The King of glory that gave up his life in heaven, gave up his glory in heaven, came down and uh, Became a became a man like me and you, and became obedient to death. What an amazing, amazing revelation! The biggest truth I believe that we will ever be confronted with: that someone loves you so much that your mind can't even start to fathom the love of God, and He was willing to prove that love. It wasn't just an emotion; he just didn't say, "I love you." He did something unthinkable. He went all the way to the cross. People mocked him, spat on him, and yet he said, Father, please forgive them, for they don't know what they do. I often think of that, and I often think, you know, how how must it feel when people insult you in the way they insulted him, and they rejected him, they despised him, they hated him for no reason. How must it feel? And the Lord said, Father, please forgive them. What an amazing and amazing passage. Can I ask Ernie and Klaus just to come and help me with the offering, please? Ernie, can I ask you just to say a prayer for us, please, brother? Thank you. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this church. Uh, Thank you for uh, the love that you have shown us, uh, Mm -hmm. the plan that you have since the foundation of the world. Thank you for the funding that you've given us. Uh, all we have needed, your hand has provided. So we just want to thank you for uh, the bounty that you have bl- uh, blessed this church with. 
and uh, we just ask that uh, funding goes through. Help us to be good stewards of what you have given us, uh, to use it wisely and for your glory only. In Jesus' Amen. name. Amen. 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 Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Janie is excited to share with us what's going on in the missions. So I'm looking forward to hear. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Hi, everybody. So missions committee is, is always active in the background. You don't always know what we're up to. You can always look on missions corner bulletin board back there, which Lou keeps updated. We, um, we have four missionaries that as a church we help to support. And we have an opportunity now to provide some extra support to one of these missionaries. And that's Joy Youssef, who it was raised as a Christian in Egypt, and she and her husband both. Uh, and they, they came to this country, and her husband started work uh, in ministry as a missionary decades ago, um, and, and um, w through, through used the internet for evangelism and for encouraging people in the Lord, teaching Bible studies. They would have trips back to Egypt. Um, he died suddenly. This is already decades ago now. And a humble, sweet wife who hardly said a word, I thought, as far as I know, knew, stepped in and took over her husband's ministry. Her name is Joy. And just lately, as she's been getting older and having some health issues, her son, their son Sam has stepped up to help her. She just spent two months in the summer there in the heat where she says, I visited I, in Aswan, a city in Upper Egypt. The temperature was 50 degrees Celsius. And 40 people died. Can you imagine that? I'm thinking, like, Joy, why did you go in the summertime? <laughs> anyway, she says, um, so, so she in all ways has carried on the ministry. It's, it's um, not a flashy ministry, but it's a very faithful ministry. And she is in touch with many people through the week um, and teaching and, and uh, encouraging. Many of them are Christians who are persecuted Christians. It's illegal to be a Christian there. So these people can't can't have jobs. So in fact, there's a whole city called Garbage City. It's in a garbage dump. And they make a living by s going through the garbage and finding things, I guess, to fix and to sell or whatever. But uh, every uh, so often, she works hard to raise some money, uh, extra money for them. So she says here in this, this most recent letter of hers, I'm sending this letter to thank you for your prayers and your support. People in Egypt are suffering more than before due to inf inflation and part of them are starving. I need to raise $6,000 for school supplies, some fans for the poor areas, and groceries as well. Please pray for me and with me to reach that goal. And in the past, we've, some we've seen occasionally pictures of them where they fill these, these grocery bags with staples of, I'm, I'm sure it would include rice and, and corn perhaps and what other whatever else is staples to last these people for a long period of time. She's trying to do that again. We, as a congregation in the past, actually during COVID, we, we had a little fundraising blitz for her to help um, to, to fill these grocery bags and also the, the fans um, and, and other needs for them, school supplies, as she mentions. We would like to do that again this year. The elders have said, yes, we can make this a project. This can go through your offering. You can use your offering envelope and designate it. Joy, designate it. Egypt, designate it. Missions, However you designate it, for the month of October, these funds will be collected. And then at the end of the month, the elders have offered to double, to match whatever we can raise as a congregation. So will you please pray about that? Keep it on your heart. And it's, it's a small way that we can help from this side of the world to that side of the world what's a worthy, a worthy ministry. So thank you and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. <coughs> Amen. Amen. Father, we're so grateful this morning that we can come to you in Jesus' name. And thank you that we can just bring this moment before you. Holy Spirit, we don't want to miss if there's anything this morning that you want to share with us, anything that you want to change in us, Lord, anything that you want to remind us of. This is the moment. We just want to give this moment to you. We declare our utter dependence upon you. Lord, we love you. We love your work. We love your people. As the body of Christ, we love you, Lord. We love everything you have made. And uh, we pray that you will use every church in this valley that confesses Jesus Christ as Lord. That your light will shine upon all of them, Lord. That they will be instruments of righteousness. And where they go and where they are, that they will speak truth. 
I pray that the kingdom of darkness will suffer loss because of people that love you and are willing to speak up what you have done. Lord, our eyes are on you. You are the center of our affection. You are the one and only, the only one that can save, the only one that can set free, Lord Jesus. Only your blood can make us righteous. And this morning we confess it as a congregation. We love you, Lord. This is all for you. This is all for you. If you are not here, Lord, we can go home. We're wasting our time. It's all for you. And we just want to praise your magnificent name. Amen. Wonderful. Now, I um, had an, an interesting moment yes, yesterday again, and, and those moments make me think. Um, I went to someone, and as I stopped outside, I got out, and there was an, an older gentleman walking with a, a walker very slowly, and you could see that he's, he's got limited movement. Uh, I found out he was 83 years old. And I found out that, that he wanted to get away from a party, from a celebration at his house. His brother was 100 years old, and there were people coming there to celebrate his birthday, and he was a bit upset with that. Or, well, not maybe upset, but he had enough, it seemed to me, and he just wanted to get some fresh air. So he was walking. So I get out of the car, and he greets, greets me very friendly, and I say, hey, how are you doing, sir? And I walk over to him, and we start talking. And um, uh, I ask him, you know, uh, are you struggling? He says, yes, he's got some nerve in his back that is constricted and he, he can't move his legs very well. I say to him, um, I don't know if you know this, but Jesus can heal you. And when I said that, standing facing me, he turned half me this side. And he said to me, he pointed to the house, he says, there's a lot of them at my brother's house, meaning people like me at his brother's house. That's why he wants to get away. <laughs> And I said to him, well, uh, what do you have to lose? You can only gain. If I pray for you, what, what, do you, what do you have to lose? He says to me, nothing to gain. And he walks off. And I stand there and I think to myself, 83 years old. He's wrestled with life. Surely he can see there's a creator who created all of this beauty. There must be something more. Maybe, maybe I should just look into, into Jesus and maybe I'll come to a truth was just such a moment again of realizing there's some people, they are just unwilling to accept the gospel. For what reason? I don't know what the reason is. Maybe somebody really disappointed him, but it was very sad. Um, yeah, so that was the end of my conversation. And uh, yeah, <laughs> I was hoping to change his mind. I was so hoping to have a word of wisdom to say, you know what? But nothing happened. It's like he made up his mind. It's, it's yeah, I don't know. It's very sad. Well, we've been speaking about Acts 4, and um, we're going to get today to the end of Acts 4, and uh, hopefully we'll get into Acts 5 as, as we go. What we, we saw, and I just before I start, I just want to say thank you to everyone that helped last week. The people that prepared the food, the ladies, everyone that was involved. It was a wonderful day. Thank you for your input. Thank you for Dan and, for Dan and Kerry giving all the fish. Really appreciate that. That's one thing I love about this congregation, just the, the unity and the, the servanthood and loving and serving and giving. I, I love it. It's a beautiful thing. And I want to thank Dave and Lydia for that as well because I think they started a fantastic thing. Um, yeah, we can just build on that. We can just build on that, that uh, goodness and kindness. So, yeah, we were talking about Acts 4, and we saw that the apostles... We're standing in front of the Sanhedrin, and they got threatened and warned to immediately stop talking in the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus made a lot of people very annoyed, very, very upset. They said, please, immediately stop talking in that name. Then they sent them away because they couldn't give them a hiding. They wanted to punish them, but they couldn't give them a hiding because the crowd were praising, glorifying. Remember we spoke, the crowd were glorifying God giving glory to God and said, man, amazing, wonderful. And we said that the crowd had more common sense than the educated ones because the crowds could see that this man was healed by God. It's impossible. Forty years he has not walked and now he's walking. Only God can do such an amazing miracle. So the crowd knew this is supernatural and a good God has done this. And then they go back and guess what? We, we spoke about that. They pray for more 
boldness. The boldness got them in trouble in the first place. They go back and they say, Lord, give us more, give us more boldness. We know there's going to be more problems and troubles, but give us more boldness. And so we read in, in Acts 4, 29. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants. When I read that, and enable your servants. I'm so glad to see that eventually they realized that they were only servants. Remember Jesus walking with his 12 disciples? After he came down the mountain of transfiguration and the boy got healed. And Peter and John and James were on the mountain with him. And they came down. And after that incident, they were walking to Capernaum. What happened on the road? They were arguing with one another. Who is the most important in the kingdom of God? Peter said, well, maybe, maybe, maybe Peter said, I'm, and John and James said, I'm the most important because I was with Jesus on the mountain. You know what was going on? And then Jesus actually took a small child and he said, who wants to be the first must be the last, must be like the small child, you know. Um, so I'm so glad they came to the understanding they're only servants. Now, I love what the Bible has, and we have spoken about this before, but just for the people that haven't heard this, there's three different words for being a servant. The one that is used here is doulos, being a bond slave, meaning I have no rights of my own anymore. I give up all my rights. Lord, I belong to you. Whatever you want, you're the master, you're the Lord. Whatever you want, I will do. Not saying, uh, Lord, uh, maybe that's too big for me. No, that, maybe that's too hard. I, I choose what I'm, no, no. A slave gives up his rights and he does exactly what his master wants him to do. Then the second one we spoke about was diakonos. A servant, somebody serving others, kicking up dust, going out of his way to look after the needs of other people. And then Paul says about himself, he says he's a hyperates, he's an under rower. He's sitting under the boat and he's rowing the boat and he's making the boat to move. He's doing all the hard work to get this boat moving. So a slave, a servant of the Lord is, is willing to work, roll up his sleeves and get stuck into the work of God. Getting people saved, getting people discipled, getting people to grow. We have a lot of those in this church, people that love discipling, love to get involved in people's lives. I love that, that we have a body that loves to serve. Um, so they, dis they discovered, they said, Lord, enable your servants to speak your word, not my word, your word, with great boldness. Verse 30. And they prayed for all the other people. They didn't pray for themselves. They said, Lord, stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. It was never a self-seeking, Lord, make us look big and strong and bless our ministry so, you know, Lord, we can gain a lot of money and have uh, influence. No, not at all. They said, Lord, wherever we go, stretch out your hand and heal the broken people. Set the broken people free. Because they saw there's so many people in bondage. We as Christians should look at the world, people that don't know Jesus Christ. They're all prisoners of war. They are all captured. They need deliverance in Jesus' name. Only when you come to Jesus, you can be set free. There's no other way. And we as Christians need to understand that, that people need freedom. And only in Jesus they can have Freedom. So they prayed for greater boldness. Now this was the second miracle. After they prayed, what happened? The building was shaken. Remember the building, building was shaken? It wasn't just in the spirit. It was a real shaking of the building. The same as the day on Pentecost. They heard a, a wind coming down. It filled the whole house. It was a miracle. And they started speaking in different tongues. There was a supernatural moment when God revealed himself. And the same in this case. The second miracle, the building started shaking and they were all again filled with the Holy Spirit. Now we're going to start today in verse 32. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. The Greek says they had everything in koina, meaning common. They had everything in common. What I love about this, the believers, the Bible makes, that verse makes it very clear. Those who has come to faith, that is a believer. We have a lot of people today that say they are Christians. 
but they're not, they're not really believers in Christ. They have not come to faith. And this word, pastuo, makes it very clear that they believed. Something happened and now they believed. They trusted, they were persuaded. It's a verb, meaning that something inside of you now are persuaded. You've exercised your will to believe that whatever happened is true. Um, so you cannot say you're a Christian if you're not believing as well in Jesus. There's too many people today that falls under the Christian name, but they are not saved. They don't have an understanding what it means to belong to Jesus. And we need to rectify that. That might be one of the first questions you ask somebody when he says he's a Christian. Say, tell me, when, when did you get saved? How did you get saved? What did the Lord do for you? When did you experience the, the Lord in your life? I would like to know. Now, a lot of people will say to you, well, and, and it happens. Gradually, my life changed, and I accepted Jesus, and I will. And that's, that's true as well. But at least there must be a moment where they say to you, I came to faith. I understand that Jesus is who he says he is. That's a Christian. Believed. Um, and they were persuaded of the truth that Jesus is who he says he is. Now this verse says they were one in heart. And that word is cardia. Now you all know the word cardiologist. Cardia is the heart. Never in the New Testament when it talks about the cardia, it talks about the meat pump that pumps the blood. When it talks about cardia, it talks about one of the deepest parts of the human makeup in the human soul, the psyche. Uh, we see that when, remember when Peter spoke on the day of Pentecost? After he told them what they did to Jesus and he told them what, who Jesus was, can you remember what happened? The Bible says they were all cut to the heart. The deepest part in their soul I mentioned, they were cut to that part and they were convinced that what he was saying is true. So, the believers were all one in heart and one in mind. That word mind is the word psyche, where we get the word soul, soul from. And you remember a while ago we spoke about the soul. The soul is your mind, your emotions, and your will. It includes your appetites, and it includes your imaginations. So they were one in heart, one in mind, you know, one in will, one in action. They were one in the Lord. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. Get people united to move in the same direction. That's a profound thing. I don't know if you know this, but Afrikaners, where I come from, if you put five Afrikaners in a room, you know what's going to happen? You'll have five different political parties. <laughs> the Holy Spirit unites people. He brings them together to work for the same goal, and that goal is to Glorify Jesus. That's what it's about. Glorifying the Son of God who gave his, who gave his life. And um, that verse continues, verse 32. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. And now we have spoken about communism and communism. Two different things. Communism is when I say what belongs to you, now mine. Communism says, what I have, I would love to share with you. Can you hear the difference? The one is forced, the other one is because I love you, my brother. Whatever I have that can make your life easy, please, let me help you. Big difference. The Holy Spirit works that generosity in us that we want to be a blessing to people. It's a beautiful thing. You can see a man that has been delivered from the love of money, how easily they can share. There's a gentleman, I won't name his name, but I, there's a gentleman here I've seen, easy for him to take out money and pay for people. <laughs> I love it. I, I just look at that and I say, huh, the Holy Spirit is working in this man's life. I can just see it. Because when people hold on to, to their money, they're still trusting in maybe in things that they're not, not supposed to trust in. But yeah, that's how far I will go. My father-in-law was an amazing example to me when I just came to the Lord. I remember at one time I needed a welding machine. And in my young mind, a welding machine was a very expensive machine. I, I mean, I couldn't afford, I, I couldn't even afford the welding rod, never mind the welding machine. And uh, one day we had a small project. I think I told you about that. 
And uh, I was looking for a welding machine, and I wasn't married to Cornelia yet, just a, a year or so or two before I got married. And he heard about it. And he came to, came to me at church, and he said to me, I hear you're looking to, to get a welding machine. I have one. It belongs to the Lord. You can use it. Just bring it back. And I was just amazed. People can be so generous. <laughs> so I got it, and I, I did the job. So that has been a good example to me. Somebody understanding everything I have is just borrowed to me. It belongs to the Lord. If it wasn't for him, I would have nothing. Um, there was, before I got saved, I met a very rich farmer. He had huge land in South Africa at that time, a very rich farmer. And uh, I remember one Christmas, we were sitting at his table. He had a, a turkey or two. There's a lot of people there. He had a turkey or two. He, ref he was a Christian, but he refused to pray for food. Because he said, I worked for my food. I will not pray for it. I've worked for it. And I wasn't even saved. I was sitting there and I was thinking to myself, well, you didn't make your own body. The fact that you are sitting here is grace. You know, surely you can thank God for the fact that you can work and have this land. It's all a gift. I mean, you're not going to take it with you. It's a gift. There's just some people that, that uh, have a different mind about things. You know, I think he was, he was blinded. Uh, not understanding that every day of his life is a free gift. Um, verse 33. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them. I love this. These, hum uh, these um, s uh, common or, or simple fishermen working with great power, testifying about the resurrection of the Lord. And uh, the, the, the Bible says God's favor, grace is favor, God's favor was on them. You know when you see the, the favor of the Lord on you and on people? Is when they, in this, in this case, when they speak to people and people actually listen. It's like your words, your words when you, when you speak it, has an entry into people's lives. I'm sometimes amazed. Sometimes the people you think the least is going to listen to you. When you start speaking, it's, it's like there's a moment, it's like a, a connection. It's, it's like I, I sometimes sense it. There's now grace, there's now something here. That is above what I can explain. And even the words I'm saying is, is so fine-tuned. I, 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 uh, there's a lot of people that can testify about it. It's not only me. You know? And you realize the Lord's favor is working here because maybe this person doesn't know how close he is to his end. Maybe this might be the last moment that somebody is going to share the truth with him. And the Lord is just pouring out his favor now to, to speak into this person's life. These apostles had the favor of the Lord upon them, the grace of God upon them. And uh, they used their opportunities. They were not shy. They did not shrunk back. They were not afraid of what people are going to say. Because they knew it's a huge thing. We are fishing for souls. We don't want people to go lost. We want people to be saved. So they knew it's an opportunity for us now to speak and trust that uh, God will save people. Verse 34. That, that there were no needy persons among them, for from time to time those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. Wonderful thing. A lot of the people that lost their jobs, and I'll tell you why, because a lot of these guys might have been working at the temple. Remember I told you that the temple was a mega money-making machine. The Sadducees, especially the high priest, was in charge of all of this. There were tables for the money changers. There were animals that were sold. I guess there were food stalls around the place for people to eat. Someone said that in a normal, in a normal time, there were maybe 40,000 people in Jerusalem. When there were a feast, it would go up to 100,000, maybe a million, I don't know, but they say a huge number of people would come to the temple to bring their sacrifices. So you can just imagine the opportunities to make money. The new Christians that were working at the temple might have lost their jobs. They might, might have lost their income, like Jenny was telling about the Christians living on the garbage dump in, Ethiopia, in uh, Egypt. You know? So amongst 
the apostles and the new Christians, they were people that were in serious need. And some of the brothers and sisters said, we feel the Lord wants us to help. How can we help? Well, we don't have a huge bank account, but we have a piece of land. We'll sell that piece of land, and we'll give it to the apostles, and the apostles will distribute it to everyone that needs. They had huge respect for the apostles. Why? Because they could see that the Holy Spirit is powerfully working through these men. If that's the case, they must be trustworthy. So people brought their money, that the land that they sold, and they gave that to the, the apostles. Now verse 36, and I think we'll have to close with this. I didn't see the time. Verse 36 says, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostle called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold the field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Those two verses, interesting. A gentleman or a brother with the name of Joseph. He was a Levite. Now, what do you know about the Levites? Remember that Levi was one of the sons of Jacob. About 1,800 years before this was written. What's interesting about the Jews, they keep their bloodline. They keep their ancestry. And 1,800 years later, he still calls himself, I'm a Jew from the tribe of Levi. What was the purpose of the Levites? They were the ones that had to lead the worship at the temple. What did God say to Moses about the Levites? They were not supposed to inherit any land because God will be their inheritance. You can go and look at that, Joshua 13, verse 14 and 33. You can go and read about that. Now, the apostles gave him, they changed his name from Joseph to Barnabas. And Barnabas, Bar meaning son, Bar Yona son of Jonah, Bar Nabas, son of Nabas. Nabas, the best that I could found, can refer to prophet or prophecy. Son of a prophet or son of, son of prophecy. So obviously he was a blessing. Obviously what came out of his mouth was like prophecy. Now what is prophecy? Prophecy is to edify the body of Christ, to speak the truth of God, to edify the body of Christ. And sometimes maybe revelation to edify the body of Christ. So he was, his name was changed from, Bar, from, from uh, Joseph to Barnabas. Now the question is, why did the apostles do that? Why did they change his name from Joseph to Barnabas? And I think they had a good example. Jesus did that. I don't know if you know, I mean you know this, that Jesus changed a few of his disciples. He changed their names. He said to Simon, Simon. Your name will be Petros. Petros meaning a small pebble. Small pebble. He said to um, the two sons of Zebedee, he changed their name and he called them the sons, um, he th named them, I can't even say this name very nicely, uh, Bonerges. Boner Bonerges means, meaning sons of thunder. So he changed their names as well. Um, he gave it. And you, you see the same thing with Saul of Tarsus. Saul changed his name to Paul. Saul meaning big and mighty, strong one. Paul meaning little one. He changed his name. He said, man, I want to be a servant. I want to be little in the eyes of God. Um, Barnabas, the Bible says, this translated mean a son of encouragement, son of comfort, son of joy, gladness, or consultation. So he was a blessing to have around. When Barnabas walked in through the doors, Everybody lighted up. Hey, brother, how are you doing? It was just a delight to be around. It was no hypocrisy. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. It's like Stephen. It's like Philip. They couldn't contain what was going, inside, going on inside. You could just see the goodness and the love and the joy and the kindness and the gentleness of the Holy Spirit just flowing through their lives. And I guess this guy was, because was one of those guys. The Holy Spirit... Loved this man so much that when you read in Acts 13, verse 2, when they were praying, the Holy Spirit by name said, set apart Barnabas. He didn't say set apart Joseph. He said set apart Barnabas. The even the Holy Spirit loved that name. And then he said, 
and Saul. The Holy Spirit didn't change Saul's name, but he accepted Barnabas' name. That's amazing. You know, son of encouragement. Um, and he really lived up to his name. He was a son of encouragement. You read further in Acts 15 that one day there was a sharp, a sharp uh, argument between Saul, Paul, and Barnabas because of John Mark. John Mark is the one that wrote the book of Mark, the gospel of Mark. Because the first missionary journey, Mark left them. He didn't go all the way. At Pamphylia, he, he chickened out, if you, if you can say. He didn't go all the way. And Paul was upset. Paul said, man, if a man says he's going with me, he needs to go with me. And Mark said, no, no, this is, <laughs> this is a bit rough. I'm going home. And then on the second missionary journey, Barnabas wanted to take Mark with. And Paul said, no. And it happened that the two of them split because Barnabas wanted to take Mark with. He gave him a second chance. He realized, man, forgive this man and, and, and do it again. Maybe he's going to learn something now. You can just see he lives up to his name, son of encouragement. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. So I'm going to stop you for today. Um, I wanted to do Acts 5, Acts 5 as well, but yeah, we're not going to get there. Um, I would love to, love to be like Barnabas. I would love people to say the same about me. I don't know about you. But where you find yourself that people will say, yeah, when Penny walks in, I, f I feel so encouraged. When she opens her mouth, it's grace. It's salt. When Ernie steps in, oh, man, I can just breathe. When I see Stu, oh, I just say, hallelujah, Lord, for these brothers. <laughs> when I see Jenny, you know, I believe that, I believe that we, we have spirits. I believe that all of us can discern in the spirit. You can sense the love of people. If they're truly born again, you can sense with your spirit, you can sense something. And it does some, I've heard often they say it rubs off. It rubs off, you know. May we rub off on one another to be like Barnabas, full of the love of Jesus wherever we find ourselves. That we will be soft with people, even those we think are messing up, those who are we will be soft and loving and kind. Let the Lord, let the Lord deal with them. We, we were called to love our neighbor as our self. Wonderful. Father, we thank you for this morning. Just thank you for people. Looking at all these beautiful faces sitting here this morning, Lord. And knowing that each one of them, uniquely made by you. You have called them. You have given them your name. You, your fingerprints are all over them. You have sealed them, those who are saved, you have sealed them with your precious Holy Spirit, guaranteeing that there's going to be more. And I thank you, Lord. I thank you that we can live this time in history. I know there's a lot of work to be done, Lord. And if we don't walk with you, we won't even understand the work we need to do. My prayer is, Lord, that all of us will deepen ourselves in walking with you. I pray that all of us will come in line. All of us will walk in the shadow of the Almighty. I pray, Lord, that you will work powerfully through every Christian in the valley that confesses you as Lord and Savior, that there will be a deepening in the Spirit. And I just pray, Lord, that you will bless our bodies. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing one more song. Amen. Will you stand and sing with us? By faith. By faith, the church was called to go in the power of the Spirit to the lost, to deliver captives, to preach good news in every corner Amen. of the earth. Let's go out knowing our commission. Sing of it now together. By faith, we see the hand of God.
Christ triumphant from the grave. By faith the church was called to go in the power of the Spirit to the lost to deliver captive and to preach good news in every corner of the earth. We will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on him, our soul's reward. Till the race is finished and the work is done. By faith and not by sight. By faith this mountain shall be moved, and the power of the throne will now prevail. For we know in Christ all things are possible. For all who call upon His name, we will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our souls reward till the race is finished and the work is done we'll walk by faith and not by sight Colossians 1 9 for this reason since the day we heard about you we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. Amen. Amen.